World Thought in Culture 3 Final Project, Fall 2017. This podcast is presented by Austin Schnell, Sarah Long, and Lindsay Schoen. For this project, we will be personifying the time periods of neoclassical, romanticism, and postmodern by critiquing and discussing six works of art from various art periods. We will discuss works in character and then give our opinions out of character. Each discussion will be preceded by a small description of the piece. Neoclassical will be voiced by Lindsay Schoen. Romanticism will be voiced by Sarah Long. Postmodern will be voiced by Austin Schnell. Let's go! Hey. Piece 1. Rage, Flower Thrower, or Flower Bomber, Banksy, 2005, Postmodern. This piece was painted in 2005 in Jerusalem. Image could be in response to many things. People being attacked at a pro-gay parade in Jerusalem, the throwing unrest in the Middle East, or overall world tensions. But the complete message of the painting is peace. There is a lot of controversy over whether this piece is vandalism or art. I appreciate the use of historical context since it reflects earlier riots and Jerusalem's history. The figure is posed nicely, even if not necessarily in a classical way. The underlying message of politics and morality is also in line with my views of what should be present. The person is not dressed in a classical way though, so that detracts from it in my opinion. That aside, this painting still has a great neoclassical element. Size! The painting takes up an entire side of a garage, which is incredible. I like the focus on an individual hero in this piece, and how it draws to the domestic and familiar, to the people who would see it on a day-to-day basis. Many different meanings can be discerned from this, and many emotions such as frustration or determination. The element of nature in the vibrantly painted flowers is a nice juxtaposition with the figure, and there's a good energy here. The figure's pose is similar to that of Liberty in De La Croix's Liberty Leading the People, which also appeals to a sense of national identity and unity. This man could easily be seen as trying to lead the way to peace, clearing the path with flowers instead of bombs. I love this painting! Due to postmodernism enjoying the implementation of political points and pieces, this is intriguing. This shows the need for acceptance and peace. An individual can be assumed to be violent, or that he would be the cause of mischief due to his outward appearance and how his body language reads, but in reality, he is bringing something beautiful to the issue, flowers. I also appreciate this piece because it was painted in a way that can be considered vandalism, so it's connected to the idea of not producing a stereotypical art piece. Out of character. So I actually really like this piece. I think it's really fun. Yeah, I mean... Like, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I, hon- I honestly like really do like it. <laughs> like, I, I would want a print of this on my wall. I think it's really... I don't know. It's, it is really special, I feel. Mm-hmm. It's an image that never really dies, I guess. Mm-hmm. That's, that's cool. Yeah, and I, I do like how, even though he looks like he could be like a miscreant, he's not. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And it's like you know, don't don't just judge people by how they, they look. Yeah. I also I like the vandalism part of it, like where it's like kind of like graffiti art. Like I genuinely like that. It's, it, yeah. It kind of reminds me of like the Berlin Wall. Yeah. Yeah. I really do. I really like this one. (laughs) (laughs) Piece 2. The Oath of the Harati. Jacques-Louis David. Neoclassical. This painting was done by David in 1784. It depicts a 7th century Roman story of a battle between a Roman family, the Harati, and a family from another local city, Alba, the Curiati. Three brothers from each family agree to battle to the death in order to settle the feud between the two cities so that they do not have to go to war. Unfortunately, the two families are intermarried. They all kill each other, save for one Harati brother, who killed one of the women's fiancé. She gets upset, and her brother kills her. This painting represents the idea of honor and the morality of fighting, leading ultimately to a Pyrrhic victory. This painting is full of the ideals that Romanticism would have been pulling away from, namely the structure of it, the geometry, and the symmetry are too stiff. The most interesting parts in this painting for a romantic would be the emotion of the women and being able to relate to their pain. The imagination it took to recreate this historical scene is highly admirable as it is retelling of the story. Looking at this piece, you can tell what is going on. And if you know the story, then there's another added layer of emotion, a complex sorrow, knowing the fates of the people who are portrayed here. 
This isn't a painting that postmodernists would bring to a dinner party, but I can appreciate the meaning. This piece can be political, considering the emotions present when dealing with death and being fearful. However, considering the use of structured shapes and it plays on being neat and orderly, I don't enjoy the aesthetic as much as I could if it was a bit more colorful or not as in order. This is from one of the most famous neoclassical painters, David. He pretty much defined neoclassicism with his heavy use of line, structure, posing, and historical context. Neoclassicism is also very much about size, which David gets right with his 10 foot by 13 foot painting. This painting is clearly broken up into geometric shapes, the two separate triangles of the men and women, and the set of three pillars in the background. The morality of this painting is also very fitting since neoclassicism is often seen as a response to Rococo, which was quote unquote immoral. For these reasons, I like this work. Out of character. Okay, so I actually do enjoy this work. I, it's, it's really well done and I appreciate it as a history student from the historical standpoint. I, I mean, I like it, but I don't feel like it's David's best work. No. Like, I understand the way he made his paintings was that he actually set up live models and had them stand there for hours and then painted them, which was like a new thing, but it just, it just seems too structured and rigid and I just don't like it. See, I get that. Like, it just seems so fixed. Like, yeah. I, like I see, I see the great meaning behind it and I can admire it and I think it's beautiful work because I know I can definitely not do something like that, <laughs> but I'm like... Okay, you're reaching for the sword. Oh no, but you're all doing it at the same time. And it's very like, everyone's sitting in one spot. I don't know. The unit each of their hands nice. is like, the, the one in the front has the lowest hand, and the one in the middle has the next highest hand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's very fixed. So you can fixed. see all of their mm -hmm. hands. And, it's just, and I get that, guys, but I don't know. I do like it though. Like, if I saw it hanging up, I'd be like, that's a nice, that's a nice painting. That's a good work. That, that's, that's nice stuff. <laughs> but I wouldn't put it in my house. That's but that's fair. okay. <laughs> my, my mom would put it in her house. That's why I'm just like, oh yes, I'm just used to this kind of art. This there is you go. what's on the walls already. Piece three, the club foot. Giuseppe de Ribera, Baroque. During the Baroque era, poor people and life were common subjects, especially in Spanish Baroque. This painting was completed in 1642. Depicted here is a boy with a foot deformity. In spite of this, he still appears happy and joyful. The uplifting point of view of the child raises his status to one that is more Christ-like. His burdens don't stop him from enjoying life. He is a pure subject. His paper reads, give me alms for the love of God. This painting looks very staged based on his stance, but I'm okay with it. I'm highly doubtful that a beggar peasant would have just casually looked so happy in a time so grim. There is too much sentiment in this piece for me, though. There is not much logic or reason to be seen here. It is very simple, though, so I do like that. However, I don't find the symmetry of the piece very pleasing. Following romantic ideals, I would like this piece of art. I would especially like how the subject is something local, someone you could pass on the street. It gives an air of familiarity and brings the art down to everyone's level. Neither the subject or the piece is perfect, and the imperfect form makes this boy more a, a relatable hero, and makes his cheer seem more noble. There are a lot of natural elements in it. He doesn't look staged or surrounded with falseness. He is out and among nature in a very harmonious way. I appreciate this image because it is able to convey a message through the use of a minority figure. The postmodern time loved to focus on the minorities, such as different races, abilities, and women. This painting, which shows an image of a happy young boy who just so happens to have a physical disability, depicts that happiness can be found no matter what situation you're in. Out of character. I really love this I piece. I love it's this so piece. Nice. It is one of my favorites that oh. we have ever covered in any class. And he just, I love it. It's such a good one. And I like the muted colors in it. Yeah, the color palette that they use is, is nice. See, I like it because I can almost, like, feel the child's emotion. Yeah. Like, I like that. Because, like, working with kids with disabilities, that's a face I love to get. Like, yeah. that smile, I'm like, I know that I am doing something right or that this kid is having a good time. And he doesn't, I mean, he's like, yeah, I got this going on, but 
I'm happy. Even yeah. if you're making me smile, I'm still, I'm happy, dude. I love it. I think he's so cute. <laughs> Look at the little dude. Ugh. Piece four, Improvisation 31, Sea Battle. Kandinsky, Modern. This piece was one of many from the Improvisation series by Kandinsky. Pictures can be seen throughout the painting, but it is very expression and abstract based. Kandinsky was a very spirited and spiritual painter, and this comes through very clearly in many, if not all, of his works. This piece is an absolute mess. There is nothing relatable in neoclassicism. The use of color can't even be credited because they are very washed out instead of strong. There is no element of symmetry or even any definable story to be garnered from this piece. To claim there are images here is just preposterous. By my neoclassical standards, this is not an art in any form. This is just madness. The colors and imagination in this piece are very admirable, but it's much more difficult to get an emotional response out of this. It's a very subjective piece. Each person will get their own meaning from it and see a different image. It's incredibly individualistic in this way, which is something I do like. I appreciate the abstract image this painting creates. I enjoy that though all of the lines and diverse colors, I still don't know what the actual meaning is, but it is enjoyable to look at and the meaning is probably portrayed differently to different audiences. I also enjoy this because most would not support that this is a fancy art, but even though it isn't seen as high art, as maybe a painting of a portrait of a queen would be, it is still a beautifully done work of art. Out of character. This is something that like I want on a t-shirt. Yes. yes. Like I would yes. wear like that's high fashion right there. <laughs> yes, it's Actually, very Sasha Valor. Yeah. I love yeah. it. That's exactly what I look like. I think Sasha Valor, drag, make me performance look like drag art, queen. beautiful. <laughs> Work it, girl. That's what I think when I see this. Actually, I'm pretty sure that this probably has been made into fashion at some point. It probably has, and they were geniuses. Yes. <laughs> like, well, I could see like some earrings, like this being on like oh, little yeah. like, triangle oh, earrings like or those something. Like glass ones. Yes. Yeah. Okay. See, we've started something now. <laughs> Piece five, Tintern Abbey, the crossing and chancel, looking towards the east window, Joseph Mallard William Turner, romantic. Romanticism was a movement against neoclassicism, favoring what most enlightened age thinkers had disregarded, imagination over reality, emotion over reason, unfinishedness over perfection, nature over the mechanical. In both art and literature, there was a move to capture the emotions of a moment or memory and be able to transfer that to the audience. Turner illustrates this in his piece here with his sketch in watercolor of a couple individuals wandering through the overgrown ruins of Tintern Abbey. This piece is small, originally belonging in a sketchbook, and captured a moment in time which many people would be able to look at and get an emotional response and connection from. The history of architecture represented in this piece is wonderful. It's a shame that it's not shown in a more contemporary fashion, though. I would prefer to have seen this as a painting of the abbey at the height of its time, with people roaming through the strong arches opposed to the crumbling ruins. The detail and line work is very commendable as well, though. Being a romantic work, I can't appreciate the underlying sentimentality of everything. This should be a picture about the architecture, not the reverence of nature retaking it. I'm not as big of a fan of this painting, but it's nicely painted. Although the structure that was painted looks sturdy and is pleasing, it isn't very original. Pieces of art that are centered around large column structures or buildings are appreciated by some time periods, but it isn't enjoyed by the postmodern era. This piece from Turner is a prime example of romanticism and the ideals it held most dear. It elevates the normal. Some people would have passed by Tintern Abbey all of their lives, so getting to see it as something in a painting would connect the audience to that place and to the memories they would have of it. The scale of the buildings dwarf the few individuals in the frame, making them part of a larger whole, as well as isolating them. Nature is clearly retaking the abbey, as seen with the crumbling walls and the overgrowth of vines. This also could pull on the imagination, looking like an image out of a fairy tale. Anyone who has seen the abbey will look at this painting and feel a sense of nostalgia and pride, having their own special memories attached to the area. The painting is not perfect. The unpainted area of the paper where you can see the original sketch or the messy details on the people and foliage just add more to it. Out of character. 
I think this painting is beautiful. I I really like it. It's something that like I would see in my dreams. It's so nice. I want to live there. I, I do. I do think it's nice. It is nice. It is nice. I can appreciate that. But whereas like I could look at like the crazy modern stuff for ages and be so entertaining. Yeah. This, this is something I would walk past at a museum and I would go, wow, that is gorgeous. And I go, okay, I'm done. Because I have a very short attention span and I don't know how to appreciate art like a normal human being. I can go, wow, that looks great. Bye. It just makes me feel calm. Like I want to like get lost inside the painting. Yes. And it, it just, it also just reminds me of the poem. Yeah. It's like, ah, yes. This it also is... makes me think like how big this is. Yeah. yeah. I mean the people. Like the are people tiny. in it are so small. And I'm just like, what would happen if I were to stand exactly where, where they're standing? How yeah. would this look to me? And I would probably feel so just like over, like overwhelmed by how everything is just amazing around me. And I'm just like this little small being. Yeah. But I'm also like, okay, cool. Uh, okay, cool. Bye. That might also be comforting in a way because it's just like, yes, I'm part of this bigger whole and mm -hmm. like, this is what we've accomplished. Yes. Where can we go from here? Also, side note, the only thing I have to say about romanticism is why do we have to have titles that are like 15 words long <laughs> done by pe people who have names that are four to five names long? Like, yeah. Why? Yeah, I get why. Because romantics are extra. That's just who they are. And I'm also extra and still. <laughs> you don't sign your paper in class with five names after you were titled. Your, your report's with like seven different titles. So I get that. Sometimes I'm so extra, I forget to sign my paper. <laughs> <laughs> they should know who I am. <laughs> Don't you tell them my handwriting. No one else looks like that. Piece 6. A bar at Follet Berger. Edouard Manet. Impressionism. This painting from 1882 was the last major work Manet produced before his death and was a gift of sorts to the Impressionist community. The Follet Berger was Paris's first music hall and major place for nightlife, which included drawing in prostitutes. The reflection and perspective is intentionally off to increase the mystery and the atmosphere of the piece. Manet was not technically an impressionist, though he is often grouped with them because he was close and with them and supported them. But this work is very impressionist leaning. I like how the main subject of this painting, the girl, draws you in with her gaze. It lets the audience have an emotional connection with her, as if she's staring at us, trying to tell us how she feels, and at the gathering she's in. Her position and attention isolates her from the rest of the crowd, drawing her closer to us than to them. There's almost a sense of camaraderie that the audience could gain, understanding the emotions of being isolated and alone, even in a large gathering. I also like the unfinished look of this painting and how it captures a moment in time making us viewers relate to our situation. This painting is somewhat enjoyable due to the abstract forms and the deeper meaning. This isn't just about this woman, it's more than that. However, the colors aren't as flashy and the image of a woman in a crowd isn't extremely original, so I'm not crazy about it, but I also don't hate it. Nothing about this painting really appeals to me. The perspective is off heavily, and the detail is very messy. Impressionist works are very blurry and not crisp, sharp images like what I would prefer. I don't understand the mixed emotions showing here. The woman's face looks devoid of emotion, which typically I would appreciate. In this case, however, her lack of emotion is almost more powerful. It's somewhat disturbing. I don't like it. I need serenity, simplicity, and symmetry. Out of character. This work is actually really fascinating whenever you actually break it down and look at every little small detail. Like up in the corner, there's just like an acrobat's feet hanging there, just chilling. Yeah. And the woman's just like, God, another day at the bar. Can't wait to go home. <laughs> it's, I don't know. I also find it kind of interesting that it's a female bartender. That was actually Ooh, really common uh, in Paris at the time. Like, but, you know, just when you see like depictions in movies and stuff, it's yeah. always going to be a guy. Yeah, uh, that's true. So That's a really good point. I appreciate it. Thanks. Huh. I was reading about this specific bar and like it was like a house for prostitutes. Like it was it was like a big center for nightlife, but it was also like sketchy. 
Like, you went there whenever you wanted more than just music and acrobatics. See, and, like, the way, like, her face is portraying it, like, I want to know what she's been through. I'm, like, as a bartender, and just by how her, like, facial expression is her and her body language i'm like what have you seen she just looks so and what sad. have you dealt with you poor like this is like it's like how i imagine like if you go to like twin peaks like how all those women feel that's how yeah. i feel like with this yeah like you're just kind of standing there and you're like why am i doing this this sucks i'm getting paid <clears throat> Or something, but this sucks. But is it worth the pain? Exactly. Exactly. It's just weird because like in the like the foreground, she's looking a little past us and she mm-hmm. looks so sad and disinterested. But if you look where she's looking at the man, who's actually a man A by the way, uh, oh. she's like leaning yeah. in and she's interested and fascinated with what he has to say. So like why are we the person that she's supposed to be interacting with any different from the skewed perspective man? Like, why did why are we treated any differently than he is? But, I mean, mirrors don't usually show what's actually true. Yeah. It's just, it's cool. Mm-hmm. It is cool. Closing remarks. This was a fun project. I actually really liked doing this. Yeah. I had a good time. <laughs> I, yeah, it was definitely it was probably the most enjoyable group project I've done. Yeah. It wasn't a pest to do it. It was actually really fun. <laughs> but... And just in general, this class, I feel like we've gotten a lot out of it, or at least I have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's been really eye-opening in some ways, and then in others, it's still familiar. So, yeah. And I really appreciate that about the World Thought and Culture series in general. So. And as someone who has, like, absolute no background knowledge of art, the fact that I just did a group project about art and I knew what I was somewhat talking about, that's a big deal. Like, I, I've learned stuff, and that's important, because I, last semester, I, you could have shown me one of these paintings, and I would not have known absolutely anything. And now I can at least point at something that's colorful and abstract and go, I think that's postmodern, or I'm pretty sure that's contemporary, and that's a big deal. I like that. We're becoming more cultured. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, World Thought. Thanks, World Thought. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is nice, though, that, like, we, we could go to a museum and actually have, like, an educated conversation with yes. each other mm-hmm. about whatever it is that we see mm-hmm. there. And not just mm-hmm. about one particular style, either. No. We can mm-hmm. talk about almost anything in, in, say, the Oklahoma City Museum of Art. We can yeah. Yeah. discuss any of those pieces. And not even just, like, the, like, just, like, based off of, like, just looks or whatever. Like, we can talk about meaning you talk about yeah. the period and the different artists like so why do so you much why do you guys think that like having so many different types of art is important Ooh. i mean other than like the basic like mm-hmm. what everybody like everyone should have art that they can relate to because right. that's a cliche basic answer yeah like i think that there's something a lot more there to it like, it's just, it's incredible to me that people started out drawing, like, these weird flat figures way back in, like, the church art time, and now we've got everything that's going on in postmodern, and it's crazy, and nobody knows what's going on with it, or who we are within the art world anymore. Like, I just, I think that says a lot about humanity, mm-hmm. that we can just change like that. Yes. We're, like, consistently evolving in ways <clears throat> that, like, we don't even realize we are, and yeah. then we look back at art, and we're like, well, someone probably thought that this was just, like normal and it was just gonna stay this way yeah and the next thing you know someone's doing something crazy and painting something weird well because art we did stay the same like mm-hmm. it stayed the same for so long whenever it was under the church patronage system and then it hit like i can't give you like an exact year but you know like 19th 20th century and it just exploded mm-hmm. and i think that's the thing though is art reflects humanity yeah yeah and the more the more we expand, I feel like the more art is going to expand. And the more things that we consider art, or what could be art, is going to get more diverse. Which isn't a bad thing. So, that's deep. That is deep. I like that. Thanks. (laughs) I feel like art can also push boundaries that, like, us as humans at certain times can't. Yeah. Like, during Mm -hmm. times. Like, I know at least, like, 
nowadays like performance art pieces that are just like incredibly abstract and people are like I don't understand what's going on that that ended up leading into like drag performance art yeah and now like the queer community is just flourishing because now we're seeing this as an art form that cliche has you know a population that is able to identify with something yeah but it's also it created a movement that like none of us even knew we needed and the next thing you know we're like oh my gosh we this We've got has paved our way. We... <coughs> you got me choked up <laughs> over so much. But yeah, no, I, it like I feel like it paves a way before we even realize it, like it's doing it. And yeah. I think that's really interesting. It's important. Art's cool. <laughs> Art wow, is cool. art is cool. <laughs> I'm gonna make that the close. I'm just gonna cut the audio right here. Just art is cool. <laughs> Done.